Good evening. You might remember that three weeks ago we finished a series through the Minor Prophets, and so for the last couple of weeks, I've been talking to you about how you can read and understand the prophets, the prophetic books of the Old Testament better. The thing that made all the difference for me in this difficult part of Scripture is seeing the predictions and the promises there about Israel as being fulfilled in Christ and through Him as being fulfilled in the church. The passage that really brought this to light for me is the one that we've been in now for the last couple of weeks and will remain in tonight. It's 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. So if you have your Bibles, look there with me. And I'm going to read it once more. It says, As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a chosen cornerstone, which is precious, and whoever believes in him will be put to shame or never be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. You might remember that this passage uses five terms that were used of Israel and things connected to Israel in the Old Testament to describe us, to describe Christians or the church, the people of Christ. And if you're wondering why this is significant, it's because it shows that we are the fulfillment of all of this under the new covenant, and therefore, we should interpret the prophetic books of the Old Testament with all of their predictions and promises in this way. These five terms, then, show us how to read and understand the prophets better. We talked about the first of these terms two Wednesday nights ago, and it was the term or the phrase spiritual house. And we saw on that night that Christ is the ultimate house of God, the better house of God. And in him, we, the church or Christians, are the new covenant temple of God. So all of those prophetic promises about the temple and a rebuilt house are fulfilled in Christ and the church. The second of these terms or phrases we talked about last Wednesday night, and it was the phrase holy priesthood, and then in another part of the passage it called us a royal priesthood or kingdom of priests, so I've just called it a holy and royal priesthood. And we saw last Wednesday night that Christ is the ultimate high priest, the better high priest, and that in him we are the new covenant kingdom of priests, offering new sacrifices, and new worship to the Lord. Tonight, we're going to look at the next two phrases, the next two terms, or terms three and four, and they are a chosen race and a holy nation. We see both of these phrases in verse nine, and in the Old Testament, both of them were used of Israel. That phrase, chosen race, referred to the race of people that descended from Abraham through Isaac, through Jacob, through the 12 sons of Jacob or the 12 tribes of Israel. Sometimes 
the race that has come from these people is called the Semites. And they're called that because they're descended from and named after Noah's son Shem. Sometimes they're called the Hebrews, and that's because they're descended from and named after Shem's offspring, Eber. And then sometimes, and for us, we would recognize this one best, they are referred to as the Jews because they're descended from and they are named after Judah. That phrase, chosen race, is probably taken from Isaiah chapter 43, verse 20 where God speaks of Israel as being his chosen or elected people or ethnicity or race. This people group was God's chosen race or ethnicity from all of the people groups of the world. God elected them. He singled them out. He elected or singled out Abraham, from every other living person, including the people that were a part of his own family, he elected and singled out Isaac from Ishmael and from Abraham's other sons through Keturah. God elected and singled out Jacob from Esau, from his own brother Esau, from the other son of Isaac. God elected and he singled out the whole family of Jacob the whole nation of Israel, from all of the families on the earth. And so that's what it means here when it calls them a chosen race or when the Old Testament calls them that. This wasn't true of the Canaanites. It wasn't true of the Cushites. It wasn't true of the Arabs or the Persians or any other race. In fact, all of the other races could only come to the Lord through this race, the chosen race. That phrase holy nation referred to the nation of Israel, the earthly, geographical, political kingdom or nation of Israel. Israel then was both a chosen ethnicity and a set-apart nationality. And we saw this phrase in Exodus 19.6 last week. It says there, God is speaking, You shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are words, and God's still speaking here, these are words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So Israel was holy. They as a nation were set apart from all the other nations in the same way that the Sabbath was set apart from all the other days, the seventh day of the week, in the same way that Levi was set apart from all the other tribes, in the same way that Aaron was set apart from all the other families in the tribe of Levi, in the same way that priests were set apart from all the other people, in the same way that the temple was set apart from all the other buildings, Israel was a set apart or a holy nation. No other nation was set apart. Not Egypt, not Assyria, not Babylon, not Greece, not Rome, no other nation. In fact, other nations could only come to the Lord through this nation, through Israel, the holy nation. Israel then was chosen and set apart for the blessing of God, for the favor of God for the salvation of God, for the life of God. They were chosen and set apart to know God, to be known by God, to be in a relationship with God, the one true God. And we might call that relationship, the Old Testament does, a covenant. And this is a reference to what we know as the old covenant, the relationship that existed between this race of people and this nation of Israel, the terms of it we find in Exodus 20, and we know that that's the passage where we find the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are the terms of this relationship or this covenant that existed between this race of people and this nationality or or this nation. The first generation after this covenant was instituted broke the covenant. and You might remember that God killed them off over the next 40 years as they wandered in the wilderness. 
The covenant then, after those 40 years, was repeated with a new generation of Israelites, and that's what the book of Deuteronomy is about. Deuteronomy means second law. It doesn't mean God gave a second law, but it means he uh, repeated it to this new generation of Israelites. And in Deuteronomy 7, 6, God says to this new generation of, of Israel, For you are a people holy. Do you hear that? A holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you. Did you hear that? Chosen race. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people or a race for his treasured possession out of all the peoples or out of all the races on the face of the earth. We've talked about this uh, somewhat recently on Sunday mornings, but I'll bring it up again. It's super important to remember. This old covenant, the terms of this relationship between the, the nation of Israel and the race of the Jews and God, it was a conditional covenant. And by conditional, that's stressed when you see the word if. And what if means there is God said, I will give you life and the blessings of, of life if you obey me. But if you disobey me, if you break the covenant, then I'm going to take those things away from you and I'm going to curse you and give you death and everything that's connected to that. The chosen race, as we remember that, and keep that in mind, the chosen race then chose to reject God. They chose other gods. When the one that all of this ultimately pointed to came, Christ, they chose to reject him and to crucify him. They chose another way of salvation. The holy nation became unholy like the other nations. And I'm emphasizing these things to make the point that they this race of people and this nation of people broke this conditional covenant between them and God. But God wasn't surprised. This doesn't mean that God's plan had failed. It doesn't mean then that God would be left without a people or that he was left without a people. From the race of the Jews and from the nation of Israel, and in some cases from other races and other nations, God all along had been saving for himself a people, individuals from the nation of Israel and some from other nations, who were made his people not by living up to conditions, but by believing his promises. And the way God all along had been saving this people foreshadowed the new covenant, what we know as the new covenant. And this new covenant was predicted in the Old Testament. It was predicted by the prophets. We have read about it before, even recently in Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36. And Ezekiel 34, God through the prophets spoke of a shepherd who would come from David and who, like David, would gather God's sheep, but unlike David, he would gather God's sheep, not from one nation, but from the nations. And when you think about that prophecy in Ezekiel 34 about a shepherd gathering his sheep, God's sheep from all the nations, it's hard not to hear the words of Jesus in John 10, where he spoke about himself as the good shepherd. And that my sheep hear my voice, and they won't follow another, but they'll follow after me, and all that God has given me, I, I won't lose any of them. So all of this was pointing to a new covenant with a new people. And it's the same people that Peter is describing in the text that we've read tonight and in the text that we've read and studied over the past couple of Wednesday nights. The pronoun you in that passage that we read is really important. It refers to this new covenant people that was pointed to even under what we know as the old covenant. The pronoun you in 1 Peter chapter 2 
refers to the new chosen race, the new holy nation. So the question before us is, who is you? Who does you in this passage refer to? Well, we find help in the passage. Look at verse 7. It says, you who believe. And then verse 6, immediately before it, said, whoever believes in him. In verse 4, it said, you who come to him. Now, we didn't read it earlier, but you could look there in verse 2. And it says, you who grow up into salvation. We didn't read this either, but you could look back to chapter 1, verse 23, and it says, you who have been born again. And then in verse 22 of chapter 1, it says, you who have purified your souls by obedience to the truth. And then in verses 18 and 19 of chapter 1, it says, you who were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers with the precious blood of Christ. And then in verse 8 of chapter 1, it says, You who love him and believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. So now, based on all of that, can you answer the question, who is you? Well, you is us. You is Christians. You is the church. And this means that Christians are, and the church is, the chosen race. The new chosen race. It means that Christians are, and the church is, the holy nation, the new holy nation under the new covenant. The word chosen shows our connection to Christ. In verse 4, he was referred to as a chosen living stone. In verse 6, he was referred to as the chosen cornerstone. And the title Christ itself means the anointed one, the one that's been chosen, elected, singled out, set apart by God to bless, to save, to redeem his people. Jesus is also the holy one of God, set apart by God, to be the holy king of a new set-apart kingdom. And this is important about Christ. You see, we've got to understand Christ because who we are flows from who Christ is. The ultimate reason that I've been saying that all of this applies to us is because really it applies to Christ. And then through him and in him, it applies to us. Because Jesus is the new covenant chosen one, we, his people, are the new covenant chosen race. And because Jesus is the new covenant holy king, we, his people, are the new covenant holy nation. And as was the case with the new covenant house of God that we talked about two weeks ago and the new covenant priesthood of God that we talked about last week, the new covenant chosen race and holy nation, these two things are spiritual rather than physical. They're a spiritual reality rather than a physical one. So what does this mean? And What does it have to do with reading and understanding the prophets better? Well, here's what it means, and we'll get to uh, what it means for understanding and reading the prophets better. Ethnic Jews and national Israel are no longer the chosen race or the holy nation. The chosen race is made up of people under the blood of Jesus, not the blood of Abraham. The chosen race is made up of people from all races, or at least it will be. Read Revelation 7, that great scene in heaven where uh, we see people from every tribe and nation and, and ethnicity that belong to the one people of God. Jewish and Gentile believers together, God brings them together, brought together to make one new 
people in Christ, where, according to Galatians 3, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, but everyone's in Christ. It's simply the people of Christ. Ephesians 2 talks about how God has brought together both Jewish and Gentile believers in Christ as one new people. You, if you want to, you can call it the Christian race. That's the chosen race. Everyone who is covered in the skin of Christ's righteousness. And it's a spiritual race. It's not a physical race. It's, it's not about what color we are, unless the color is the, the righteousness of Jesus, the perfection of Jesus, the, 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 the blood of Jesus. The holy set-apart nation is made up of citizens of the kingdom of God not the kingdom or the nation of Israel. It's made up of citizens who follow King Jesus rather than merely the right earthly king. This holy set-apart nation now under the new covenant is made up of citizens who were characterized by holiness, who live for and strive after and seek to be holy as their God is holy. It's made up of citizens not from one nation, but from all the nations. Again, look at that great scene in Revelation 7. The holy set-apart nation is made up of citizens who are Christians from America and from Arab nations and African nations and Mexico and Russia and China and all the nations of the world. And brought all together, they make up one new nation, one that will replace the nations and the kingdoms of the world and a kingdom that will never, never, never pass away. Now, here's how this helps us read and understand the prophets better. When we read or when we hear about from the, the prophetic books of the Old Testament or for that matter, anywhere from the Old Testament, when we read or hear about Israel, about promises and predictions to that race of people and to that nation. We should interpret them as being about Christ and us, about Christ and his church. Understand that what is going on now in the church and what will go on in the future in the church and what has been going on in the church since the coming of Christ is the fulfillment of all of those promises and predictions rather than understanding them to point to some future fulfillment with a physical race and a physical nation. This is how you can read and understand the prophets better. It's been good to be with you again tonight talking about this. I don't know that I've ever been more excited to announce anything Remember that this coming Sunday, we're going to be back together. We're going to meet at 10 o'clock in the sanctuary. Uh, we're going to practice social distancing the best we can by marking off every other pew so we can only sit in every other pew. We're going to ask you to sit with your families. And if you sit on a pew with people that's not your family, and we know that's going to happen, uh, stay at least six feet away from them. But we're looking forward to that. And we're going to do it that way through the end of the month, meeting every Sunday at 10 o'clock in the sanctuary, no Sunday school, no children, youth activities, no nursery, no choir, taking up the offering in a little different way, all of that kind of stuff to try to follow the rules. We will also meet throughout the remainder of this month every Wednesday night at 6 o'clock, same way in the sanctuary, same deal going on, that's all that will be happening 6 o'clock in the sanctuary on Wednesday nights, everybody together doing all the same things that I just talked about. And that will be next Wednesday night. So I can't wait to see you. Before I pray, I, before I close us in prayer, I, I have several prayer requests to remind you of. And unfortunately, the vast majority of it has to do with the deaths. I, I want you to pray for Woody West and his family. His father, Don, died and his funeral is today. In fact, I'm about to head out that way. And then I want you to pray for the family of Verlinius Powell. Her funeral was yesterday. And then I want you to pray for Judy Grimes and her family. Judy's father passed away earlier this week, and his funeral is tomorrow. And then last night, 
unexpectedly Ann Sim's daughter died. And we want to pray for Ann and for Ann's family. And then I also want to remind you to pray for Shirley Horton. Shirley's been in the hospital for weeks. She had been doing so much better and she took a turn for the worse uh, earlier this week. Uh, so we want to pray for Shirley, that God would heal her and, and get her back home. Okay, good to see you. Bow with me and let's pray. Father, I thank you for this time. I thank you for how you as a promise maker are a promise keeper and you have fulfilled these things that you promised and predicted long ago through Christ and through this people that belong to him that we're so privileged and grace to be a part of. We do join together in praying for these families that are mourning and asking that you would comfort them and just pour your great grace out on them. And we pray for Shirley that you would heal her and bring her back to Monroeville and, and back to us and, and back to her family. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. Uh, we're so excited about Sunday morning, and we look forward to that. I pray that we can do that in a way that would honor you and in a way that would be safe and good. I, I ask that you'd protect us and continue to be with those that are dealing with this terrible virus. We love you, Father. We praise you. We do look forward to being back together. Prepare our hearts even now for our first corporate worship gathering in quite some time. And I pray we would celebrate you, the God that's above it all, and the God who has sent his son to save everyone who will turn from his or her sins and trust on him for salvation. We pray it in his name. Amen. Mm -hmm.